Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest today is Professor Jennifer Ruger, an associate professor at the Yale School of Public Health and former co-director of the Yale World Health Organization Center for Health Promotion Policy and Research. Professor Ruger is working to promote the creation of public health programs that make more efficient use of scarce resources while improving current health care practices. The Institute of Medicine recently invited her to testify about how the management of global health institutions and governance might be improved. Professor Ruger is here today to talk about the IOM report on global health and share some of her insights. Welcome, Professor Ruger. Thank you. Healthcare in the United States today is complicated. There are huge disparities, and um, a solution to those problems seems elusive at best. Why look at global health? Well, especially in these economic times, it would be certainly uh, prudent of our government to focus on the health care system here in the United States. Um, and there are, as you indicate, a number of disparities in health care um, and access and financing in the United States um, that are um, differentially impacting the American citizenry. Um, however, um, if you look at uh, the U.S. healthcare system within a global perspective, we see that um, compared to many developing countries, uh, the United States healthcare system is actually uh, quite developed and, and uh, uh, quite strong. Um, for example, the uh, expenditures uh, for an individual on health care in the United States are over $5,000, uh, whereas in many developing countries we're talking about $100 or less and even as low as $10 uh, per person in health care spending. Um, also, we see uh, major differences in the health care infrastructure in developing countries versus the United States. Uh, for example, the number of physicians or nurses uh, per person or per 1,000 uh, people in a population are significantly different um, by even a hundredfold um, in the United States versus many developing countries. And on and on, there's a number of, of major differences between the healthcare system in the United States and, and in many developing countries. Alongside that, we see a major significant difference in the burden of disease uh, in uh, developed countries in general, in the United States in, in particular, and many developing countries. For example, life expectancy differences. Um, in the United States, um, on average, uh, uh, Americans live over, over uh, 70 years. Um, and um, in many developing countries, um, especially uh, in, in Africa, um, the life expectancy is less than 40 years or 45 years. So the major differences and the, the scope of the problem of the healthcare system at the national level, um, even though we have great problems in the United States, is, is quite significant in many developing country contexts. So the United States uh, is interested from a global perspective in how it can um, better um, engage with the global community to improve uh, health systems in developing countries. The IOM report to which you contributed addresses the question of how the U.S. government can improve global health under the new administration. Share with us some of its findings. Well, the, um, the um, Institute of Medicine recently convened a committee and a uh, set of working groups to focus on different areas of global health in which the United States can contribute. Um, and um, some of the main issues that uh, this uh, committee was looking at in the report uh, uh, recommendations um, outline uh, around several key issues uh, in global health in the U.S.'s role. The first is um, the U.S. Um, having a major role in global health as a, as a component of foreign policy, as a component of U.S. foreign policy. And the recommendation from the report in that domain was to actually enhance the U.S. role in, in global health as a major um, strength of our U.S. Uh, foreign policy. Um, the second uh, major area of recommendations from the report was in um, the area of global health financing. Um, and the recommendations in the report were um, along a number of different areas of, of, of financing. 
Um, the first was to actually increase the uh, amount of money that's invested by the U.S. government in uh, developing countries in global health, either multilaterally through the global health system of global health institutions um, or bilaterally directly uh, investing in, in global health from the United States to another uh, a country. Um, the recommendation by the report was actually to double the investments from $7 billion to over $15 billion in the new administration. Um, another area of financing that the report um, focused on and recommended was that the actual um, portfolio of investments in global health change um, somewhat significantly. Um, so an emphasis was placed on um, with this increase in investments, um, spreading the investments around um, different diseases. So not just focusing on just a particular disease like AIDS or malaria or TB, but focusing on um, the infectious diseases and the non-communicable diseases that um, contribute to the greatest uh, burden of disease in, in many countries. Um, another area was uh, of recommendations in terms of funding was around um, strengthening health systems in developing countries um, and focusing particularly on financing and um, human resources and the infrastructure. Um, the third area of recommendations for the report was around governance issues, uh, both within the United States um, in terms of its commitment to global health and global health governance. So, um, within the United States, a recommendation was made to coordinate better the different policies and programs that the United States has in global health. So when the Centers for Disease Control is doing something um, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is doing something in the State Department, that we actually have some sort of a coordinating mechanism. And actually there was a specific recommendation to create an office and a position within the White House um, for uh, global health. Um, so more coordination, a, a more coherent strategy uh, within the U.S. Um, towards investments and work in global health. And then on the global health uh, governance um, dimension, a recommendation was made again towards greater coherence. So the U.S. Um, would um, uh, engage with the global health community um, primarily through um, the World Health Organization or another uh, major uh, coordinating mechanism so that the, the United States, along with other countries and other different programs in global health, try to um, coordinate and um, align the investments in global health to have greater impact. Um, a final area um, of, of, of recommendation was in, the er was in um, investments in health-related research that the U.S. through the Fogarty Institute, the National Institutes of Health, um, other um, areas of health-related research has actually uh, been very beneficial in focusing on coming up with um, um, new uh, discoveries about disease. Uh, diseases and how to um, prevent them and treat them. And so uh, an emphasis was made on uh, improving and enhancing our investments in research mm -hmm. related to diseases in the health systems of developing countries. Sounds like a lot of good recommendations. Um, initially, you touched on foreign policy. Why should health care be one of the foundations of U.S. foreign policy? Well, this was an area of the discussions among the committee that I found to be the most interesting. Um, it, there seems to be a greater shift in thinking about health as a foreign policy issue now than there has been in the past. Um, in particular, um, previous work in global health has really um, emphasized health as a part of U.S. foreign policy in terms of America's self-interest or what, why would America or Americans uh, be interested in promoting health in developing countries and why should that be a part of our foreign policy um, from our perspective in terms of national interest. Um, and that's still a major component of the rationale for why the U.S. should be involved in global health. Um, but it seems like there's a, a, a shift now um, more towards the global interest um, and that the U.S. should be involved in global health and global health should be a part of our foreign policy because um, the U.S. as a, um, uh, an economically developed and one of the more economically developed uh, countries, um, a leader in, in, in global uh, diplomacy, um, has a responsibility and opportunity 
to um, enhance um, the global interest um, of, of reducing uh, the disease burden in many developing countries. And that, that actually is more of a long-term view, that if America focuses on health as a foreign policy issue, that um, global interest will be um, enhanced, but also American interest in the, in the longer run. And what does that mean? That means that um, health, investing in health is good for economic development in developing countries, which is ultimately good for the United States and for the global uh, economy. Investing in health is good for security. Uh, it's better um, for peace. Um, and we see many um, areas of the world where um, there are major disease burdens um, and there's a great deal of civil uh, conflict as well. So investing in health is good for security and peace at the global level, but also for Americans. Um, and that these ideas of investing in, in global health are also um, um, founded in ethical commitments, um, that it it's really is the right thing to do uh, for America. So it's, an, it's a very interesting, having seen this over a number of decades, a very interesting shift in um, the rationale for why the United States should focus on health as a foreign policy um, component. Mm -hmm. And who controls global health policies now? Well, global health policy is um, a very vague <laughs> concept. It's a, you know, there's a lot of um, groups, um, institutions, individuals, countries that are involved in, in global health. Um, one term that we typically use uh, to describe global health uh, policy is the global health architecture. So what are the different institutions that are involved in global health? I would say first and foremost is, is countries themselves, national governments, ministries of health, um, and ministries of finance that um, support uh, ministries of health and, and, and fund um, the health systems and public health programs in, in developing countries. So I think uh, this is often, uh, often um, um, not as emphasized in the global uh, um, health architecture, but national um, uh, governments, um, national health programs, and at the subnational level, state and provincial um, governments are important uh, in the global health architecture. Um, at the global level, we have um, a number of different global health institutions, and that is another area uh, that has changed significantly in the past, even in the past five and ten years, and particularly in the past five years, we've seen an escalation of the number of players and actors in global health. We, we used to be that at the global level there was more or less the United, United Nations system with the World Health Organization, UNAIDS, um, and, um, and other uh, UN agencies, uh, the World Bank, um, and um, now we see a, a, a plethora of different institutions involved. We have the Global Fund, um, there's the PEPFAR, the Pre President's um, um, Program for AIDS, um, we have um, an, the Gates Foundation, a number of um, private entities involved in global health, civil society, NGOs. I mean, it's just an enormous number of different uh, institutions and actors, both on the funding and the financing of global health, but also in the impl in implementation and the program development um, and, and policies on the ground. So one of the um, key issues that was addressed in the report, and that's why the World Health Organization was recommended um, as a, um, a coordinating mechanism uh, was that um, in, in, many, in many respects, and we're actually seeing this in the evidence now, um, at the country level, um, a pluralism in global health um, financing and program development um, can be burdensome to countries. Uh, it can be very difficult to manage a number of different donors um, and with different agendas um, and uh, working at cross purposes sometimes. Um, and so an effort was made or a call to action uh, was taken in the report to try to find uh, a, a coordinating mechanism for trying to um, really uh, bring together these different institutions and players around shared objectives. And I think that goes back to the ethical commitments and also the global interests uh, that were the foci of the report that really 
you know, all these different institutions and players are, 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 are to be in the global health architecture to improve health in, in, in developing countries. Um, and aligning um, our uh, efforts around that sh shared goal um, can uh, create greater impact. Along those lines, um, an emphasis was made in the report um, with respect to the global health architecture and to U.S. commitments in global health to try to measure the impact of uh, the U.S. programs in global health and um, other entities in the global health architecture on health outcomes. Um, I know that sounds very obvious, um, but that has not typically been the case uh, in looking at uh, these programs. In, in, in financing and donor um, development, for example, um, typically the amount of money spent or a loan that was dispersed had been the measure of success or the measure of progress. And um, that's not really the final end goal. The end goal is to reduce, reduce disease burdens, to improve life expectancy, to reduce uh, infant and child mortality, um, to improve the prospects of uh, a pregnant woman uh, in terms of her uh, mortality and morbidity outcomes. So these are, the, these are the measures of success that the international community um, has to um, align itself with uh, in, in, the, in the future years. Okay, so you have highlighted several of the recommendations um, that the report uh, makes. How realistic do you think the recommendations are? Well, I think the report and the committee um, at large um, had a very nice balance, a uh, healthy balance of idealism and realism. Mm -hmm. um, idealistically, um, there are some major goals um, that uh, need to be achieved, and as I just said, uh, the focus is on health and the health impact. Um, and along those lines, the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, are, um, are, are dimensions of uh, the measure of the health impact. So uh, child mortality, um, infant mortality, uh, maternal mortality, um, the uh, disease burden in terms of HIV and AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis. So, um, you know, the, there are um, dates by which um, the global community has suggested that um, uh, we, in the broad sense, uh, achieve these objectives, and those are those are um, those are uh, difficult objectives. Um, but you know, they're 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 idealistic in some sense, but they uh, need to be realistic in the sense of really uh, motivating. Uh, people uh, and, and organizations to move forward towards them. Um, the more um, organizational efforts, um, and there are a number, there are a number of, of different factors that have that are at play in terms of achieving health outcomes. So it's very difficult. Sometimes that's very difficult to measure and attribute um, health impact. Um, the organizational, the governance. Um, objectives I think are very realistic. Um, I think that the United States has identified through this report um, for the new administration um, ways in which it can reorganize and, um, and coordinate and hold itself accountable. The new administration is very focused on outcomes and transparency um, and, um, and very pragmatic in those ways. And I think this fits very nicely um, with um, those objectives. Um, so I think that's very realistic and it can definitely be achieved. Uh, similarly, the financial commitments um, certainly can be uh, achieved, um, a doubling from $7 billion to $15 billion. Um, not that that's small change, uh, but, um, and we have a, a scarcity now with the current climate, with the economic crisis and, um, and, and the current legislation that's, um, that's um, being considered. Um, but that said, um, we're seeing that, um, we've seen some early signs that the, um, the current administration is interested in global health um, and um, has, has, um, um, has, has some um, knowledge of some of the issues and I think has uh, shown a, a commitment and I think it is fairly realistic to assume that that administration will take on uh, that particular recommendation. 
Um, I also think that um, in terms of the portfolio and focusing on the broader range of diseases on, and the health system focus um, recommended by the report, um, that, that yes, that would fit very much with um, the new administration's uh, broader sort of view of things and in particularly results on the ground. Okay, so you're optimistic that the Obama administration will um, be able to implement the recommendations, so there is hope that um, there will be an improvement in global health? Well, I think that, um, yes, I think that I'm optimistic about our current administration and I'm also extremely optimistic about the overall global climate. Mm -hmm. um, in the last two decades, I don't think I've ever seen a time where there's been so much enthusiasm um, towards uh, global health. Um, we've seen doubling of investments financially. Uh, we've seen, again, uh, the introduction of a number of new um, institutions and players. Um, we've seen, so enthusiasm, I think, is, is quite, uh, quite uh, ample. Um, the, um, that's why the governance issues are so critical. Um, it's really trying to uh, coordinate and bring people together on the same page uh, to achieve the results on the ground. But I, but I do think, yes, I think the U.S., the, the Obama administration, um, and also the global uh, commitment that we're seeing um, um, is, is ripe for uh, a, the um, implementation of a report uh, like the IOM has just pursued. Wonderful. That's good news. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing your insights um, on the IOM report. For more information about Professor Ruger, her work, and the IOM report, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you. Thank you.